Welcome to the startup grind. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, tonight, uh, you are attending Startup Grind for the 12th uh, time or 12th edition. Uh, this is also the, the last edition of 2016, uh, since the December. Um, tonight, uh, we are hosting uh, Peter Komarnik, uh, the CEO and co founder of Slido, uh, Slovak based startup. Yeah, round of applause, please. For those who are attending um, the startup grind for the first time, I mean, let me tell you what we do, uh, who we are. Uh, we are a community of entrepreneurs. This first startup grind was uh, run and founded in 2010 in Silicon Valley. Uh, we are supported by Google for Entrepreneurs, and it's a global community of around 400,000 entrepreneurs. Uh, we are in 200 cities and 85 countries, and you are. Um, basically uh, now actually becoming part of it. Our main values are uh, sh share, uh, so we have a networking uh, session afterwards where you also get to uh, speak and talk to uh, to our speaker and also you know share uh, your knowledge and, and contacts among yourself. I see that we have some entrepreneurs in the audience and also uh, students, so uh, I think it's, a, it's an interesting crowd. Um, before we kick off, uh, I really would like to thank uh, our supporters, our media partners, um, mainly, uh, well, uh, as a sponsor, KPMG and Startup Studio and uh, Slovak Telecom. Also, I would like to thank uh, the City University for providing us uh, with this space, um, why we are here and uh, probably you've attended, uh, if you've attended our, our uh, events in the past, we travel in the community, so uh, we go through co-working spaces, innovation hubs, and uh, also from time to time to the offices of, of, the, of the speakers. Um, but before um, I invite Peter on the stage, um, I would like to uh, point out that we'll be using, guess what, Slido tonight. Uh, we are using hashtag SUGBA, so if you just go to then uh, slido.com uh, and you enter this hashtag, uh, you can ask any question. Uh, it will be uh, displayed on the screen behind me. Um, I will leave around 10 to 15 minutes at the end to, uh, to go through the questions. Right, so without further ado, I would like to invite Peter on the stage. Please, round of clap. Round of clap. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. All right, Peter, so welcome to uh, the, the 12th Startup Grind, and uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, accepting the, the invitation. Um, we usually start uh, the discussion with kind of the, the background and your history. Uh, so why don't you tell us, I mean, where you grew up and maybe, you know, start from uh, the university or like even the high school times. Okay, so hi everybody. And just before I go into it, uh, I would also like to encourage you to use Slido because I have so many things to say and I want to make sure, you know, I address what do you really want to know? So if I can also, before I start, so it will help me maybe to direct the message a little bit. How many people are students here? So, okay. And how many people are in a startup right now? Three. And uh, how many people would like to have a startup or would like to work for a young company? Okay, cool. And the rest, uh, why are we here? <laughs> uh, anyway, cool. So I will try to make it, uh, you know, relevant for you guys. If you have any questions, even like besides Slido, you would like to jump, jump in, uh, you know, feel free. Really, like, make, let's make this much more conversation. Uh, so going back to your question, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm actually from Bratislava. I grew up here in Lamach. Uh, I went to high school, Krasnigova, uh, so-called Gamcha. Great school, recommend. Um, and then I had no idea, like, you know, for the high, for the university I was totally clueless. Uh, I was trying to apply abroad, but my English sucked. So I ended up at the Faculty of Management here uh, at the University of Cominius, uh, where I had the luck that I went for Erasmus uh, to Norway for half year. That was really kind of the changing point uh, where it kind of opened my horizons and I, I knew that, okay, I want to be abroad because the standards, everything is like somewhat different from Slovakia and can grow you. So then I studied for two years uh, in Korea where I did my MBA. 
Sure. Um, so, and you, you mentioned that uh, the going abroad was kind of the, the changing uh, factor. Um, do you think it had an impact on your thinking that maybe I want to be an entrepreneur or were you thinking that, okay, let's do the corporate way? No, absolutely. Like the, I'm not sure if I decided I want to be an entrepreneur when I went abroad, but it was just such like such a shock for someone who basically spent the whole life in Bratislava. How many of you were abroad? Like, How many of you studied abroad? Okay, so more, around like 50%. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, and I, I would really recommend it, like, even if you didn't study there, at least go there for some part of your life, live there and really like see how people outside of Slovakia are doing things. And um, for me, what was really interesting in Norway, I had the chance to kind of get to know Asian slash uh, African people that have totally different values and, and mindset that, than we have. And it was so fascinating and I think just this exposure to new things, it opens up your horizons and it's also critical in entrepreneurship to really have like horizons very open. So I think that definitely was a critical thing. Um, what would you say about the South Korean kind of methods of teaching? Because I don't think, who's been to South Korea? No one, right? So, uh, was it similar to how we do it here in, uh, in Europe? I don't think I had the authentic uh, South Korean uh, teaching. It was much more like an English program, but basically South Koreans, it's forbidden to raise the hand and ask a question. Sounds similar, uh, you know. It was not the reason why we started Slido, but basically they cannot really like almost say anything in class. It's considered rude to the professor if you ask him. It means that he didn't explain properly, it's crazy. So, uh, yeah, it's a very different culture, but we had a very international crowd, and it was, it was interesting to see uh, the different scope. But also what was really, really kind of, what's really good about the foreign experience is that if you do well, it kind of gives you confidence. Okay, we can, you know, we can make it out there in the world. So I, the nice part about the uh, South Korean MBA was that the last semester was actually, we could choose uh, one of the best schools in the US where we wanted to go, so we could choose from MIT, uh, Harvard, Michigan, and so on. And I went to Kellogg, which at the time was uh, ranked number one for marketing. And I went there and I had like zero confidence. I was like, shit, what I'm gonna do? I'm like, this guy's gonna destroy me. And actually, it turned out that they were like normal guys who you know, worked hard, but you partied hard. They were like the same people as we are. And if you give your best, you can easily compete with them. And that also played uh, later with Slido. We knew that if we wanna make a world-class product, we need to go out there and compete against the best and not stay here. Um, so was the MBA part of some kind of, like, uh, so was it straight from your masters or was, this, was it like a gap year between? So that's like, that was totally random. Uh, after I came back from Norway, uh, I was in my third year and I knew I wanna go for masters out abroad. And I think it was April 4th or something when I saw an ad in, uh, on the faculty of management that was saying, okay, Samsung is looking for smart students from Slovakia to, for the MBA program in, in, in Korea. And the deadline was in two days. So I applied, I had competition maybe with five people. So, you know, I somehow won. <laughs> it was not that difficult. And um, then actually Samsung sponsored the whole MBA, but then I had to work for them for four years. So after the study, I actually uh, had to work for Samsung. And even though it was completely different than what it was supposed to be, they just opened the Vodirati factory here. So I was basically part of the Vodirati factory for, from the beginning. I was actually in the in the committee that helping the committee that when they were deciding where to go to which country. That was pretty exciting. Uh, I was you know trying to push for Slovakia. I don't think uh, I helped much, but you know it was a nice feeling when they decided to go here. So I basically started there from like when there was nothing built. So from university to a corporate life. Uh, so you spent four years at Samsung. Uh, what what was next? Then I worked for one year for Google. Uh, that was also totally random. I, I quit Samsung like exactly after the four years that I had to be there. So, you know, like, get me out of here. Uh, and I was like, okay, what, what I'm gonna do? And I applied to several jobs, no one replied. Like, I thought like, okay, I'm unemployable or something. Like, <laughs> was, like and then a friend of mine told me that uh, I had a friend in McKinsey and he said like, his former colleague is actually starting Google in Slovakia at the time. So I wrote to uh, the Google guy, we had lunch. Uh, he said, I'm not a good fit. Uh, but then he said, okay, we might have you know, a junior role somehow. Uh, 
if you would like to do it, I said, okay. I went basically to one third of my salary. I took the job. I was doing a shitty job at Google at the beginning, but it was a great experience because the team was great and you, you basically saw how the whole office was being started and, and the team was really good and the roster is a great leader. So uh, it was an interesting year. Definitely also helped to shape the beginnings of Slido. So I guess that's now bridging actually. From after, so after Google, we're talking about this 2012? 2012. So actually it was during Google. Uh, like after the one, one year, uh, we were also like I was teaching at a university at the time. And we were trying to do a non-profit project that would kind of help to increase the quality of the universities in Slovakia. And we we're thinking it was about rating the professors. Like we wanted to show there are really good professors in Slovakia as well. And by you know showcasing the good professors, we wanted to increase the motivation of other ones like to try harder and then by making it transparent you know if you want to improve the quality you first need to know what the quality so that was the idea there and we thought with some friends there that let's let's make an app that will make it really easy for the professors to have instant feedback because I was basically using small papers in my classes from students and uh, we decided okay let's build this app so we went to the startup weekend we didn't want to start a company we didn't want to do business we just wanted to build this for the non-profit project and Somehow we won the startup weekend. Uh, Fero sitting there, like joined the team at startup weekend. We had a great developer join the team, and all three of us were in a position where we were thinking, like, okay, what to do next? So we're like, you know, let's. We have three months in spot for free, so let's sit there. <laughs> let's see what happens. Uh, and then we went to another competition in Vienna. We won that, and we went like to Berlin and London, and seemed to start having some kind of momentum in terms of competitions, not in terms of customers. That sucked. Uh, but then we were lucky that as we were still kind of going to these competitions and it looked interesting, uh, one of my former colleagues introduced me to Hospara Skenovini. They were running uh, a conference and he's this amazing guy that that makes an introduction, uh, how it will be in the future, you know how it is. So he introduced me like, oh, my amazing colleague, they have this amazing tool, so, you know, like you have to use it for a conference. So when I came there, they were all already sold. So I showed them, you know, it was instant feedback at the time. So I showed them the tool and they're like, oh, hmm, that's nice. Like, yeah, we could we could use this instead of the paper. Um, but we were actually thinking that like, we would also like people to be able to ask questions, you know, and send tweets. And we're like, you will use the feedback thing. We'll build the questions and the tweets for you. So we'll build it like in two days. Um, and that's Slido. So um, maybe for those who don't know what Startup Weekend is, but that's like, uh, Hackathon kind of style event where you actually have 44, f uh, 54 hours and you meet your founders and co-founders and you know, try to build a prototype. Um, so that leads me to another question. Maybe we, we skip that. Uh, how did you meet your founders? Because you know, being a successful entrepreneur, you know, it cannot be one person. It's, you need to have a team. So that was during the startup weekend. That, that was super lucky. Like it was. So it was luck. Like you just met the great, you know guys on the spot, and you, like, you knew like this is the guy I'm gonna build a successful startup. So with. we knew with Ferro from the previous startup weekend, and I kind of wrote him email uh, a few days before like he's coming, and he was like, oh, I can't. But then he came, and like we would never win without him. And the developer he was also like completely lucky. So it was a huge part of luck. Like in so many ways during the four or five years, there was so much luck uh, involved. But yes, I think like the. The fact that we had the developer, a designer, and me as kind of business hustler, uh, that was really essential. Like those three roles, I think, are necessary for almost any startup. Um, I usually like to spend some time actually discussing about the, the team because uh, it's like maybe 70% of the failures is because of the founders. Uh, so, you know, meeting new people at a, rent, at a place that, you know, you basically you didn't know them that well. Um, when was the point you knew, like, Okay, uh, these are the ones. Like, was it the values they shared, or was it the drive? Was the attitude towards work? What What do you think it was the most? I think the startup weekend is a really great kind of opportunity for you to get to know the people because you spend basically fifty four hours working with them, and literally, like Peter, our CDO, he's uh, so the, he is very cool under pressure. So the second event, like Vienna, it's very start very similar to startup weekend that we went to. When I was going to stage, which was already like 45 minutes late, he was still finishing the code. And I was like, Peter, is it ready? And he's like, give me a second. He's like, okay, you can go. And I'm like, it's gonna work. It should. <laughs> and it worked. Uh, and you know, like, 
you can see the dedication, you can see like, so he had everything he needed to have. And Fedor, like, he didn't have to help us at all. Like, he was not actually officially at the beginning part of the team, but he just, you know, helped us and we would never win without him. Like, you could see the passion, you could see the willingness to, to go for, for the big thing. And I think we didn't think about it at the time. We just felt like, okay, this was fun and let's let's see how where it leads. But uh, yes, like, if you look back at it, like, we share a lot of uh, the values. Like, that's the critical part. We have so many you know, values in common. Um, then, you know, from a startup weekend, you know, doing a business, that's another big step. Um, could you describe us the, the process? So you went to the spot, you worked for three months out, out of the spot, which is a local co-working space. Um, what was the experience, we you know, making business out of the idea, or like the, the prototype? It sucked. <laughs> like after half a year, we were sitting, it was like uh, December 2012, we were sitting, you know, we did 10 conferences, two of them were okay, eight of them were like, like really Slido didn't add much value. And we were sitting there, you know, after six months of really hard work and we were like, shit, this is, like, is this what we wanted? Like, is, we didn't think it's gonna be this hard. And is this really something we wanna do for the next, I don't know how many years? Like we had completely uh, wrong expectations about like what, how long it's gonna take, how easy it will go. So after that half year, there was a moment actually where we were probably closest to just giving up. But thankfully, we already had one very interesting client in the pipeline, and actually, it was Sparrow at the time who said, "Like, hey, come on, guys, like, let's give it a few more months, and we'll see then." You know, and thankfully, like that client that was somewhere in the middle of January, and it was the first international event, like very good crowd, very good speakers, very good attendees, and it worked like magic, and it really changed the, the event. I think for startup, it's really critical that you start believing in your tool and in the value you bring. Because you have some ideas, you have some tool, but when you're talking to the customer, you're not really convincing because you don't believe. But if you really believe, then you can convince. Now when I'm talking to customers, they feel, they, I can really say things that don't make sense, but they feel for me that, okay, this is gonna help your event. And they know that I believe it and they can feel it. But at the beginning, you're like, um, you know, so you're gonna get some good questions. And you're like, we had no clue, we didn't really, understand the value we're bringing. And I think that's really changing as the startup is growing and you're giving more value. And uh, how did you grow? Did you grow organically, like, you know, getting more and more clients or did you yeah. need some external kind of injection? Yeah, so we basically bootstrapped the first year uh, from our savings, three of us. Uh, but like the, the next year, the first three months, we had maybe 10 events, so the same as, as the year before. Uh, and then my little one was born, so my first child was born, and then we had like 60 events in the next three months, so a little bit of change, and that was, get, that was starting to get crazy, and we started to have like interesting clients with SAP, and then some like IDC, some bigger clients who were doing good conferences, so we started having some confidence in our own solution, uh, and by June, like we were completely destroyed, so we knew we need more people into the team, so we uh, hired two more developers, and. Uh, Peter Kreinak, if anyone knows, he basically opened up uh, our London uh, business. And then Andre, Andy Christopher, who basically took over a lot of the support uh, from me. Uh, so we were seven people after June. And we actually also uh, got the first two angel investors in, in summer. Uh, like that's why we are very able to afford those additional people. So and this is already the point that you know you do some kind of international business, international expansion. Um, what were the, 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 well, success and fail stories of international expansion, or if any, fail stories? <laughs> uh, you know, the more mistakes you do, the more chance you will actually achieve something. Uh, so we, we made like so many mistakes, and so many fuck ups, and still, like, every week I do a few of them. I can mention some of them later. Uh, but the funny thing about the international expansion uh, is like at the time, uh, like in, in May, June, we finally had some events in Vienna, Prague, and so that went well. Uh, but we still didn't know, okay, is this gonna be interesting in London or in, in New York? And we knew that okay, if we really build, wanna build like a great tool, we need to go out there. And London was the closest. So actually, Peter, uh, in September, 
we we had a plan. Like he basically took his backpack and he was like, okay, I'm going to UK for two or three weeks and I'm going to start a business there and then I'll come back. You know. So he came back after one year. Uh, the business was far from starting, but for the first half year, basically, he was sleeping on the floor of uh, a friend of us. He was basically every day he was going to network events, to different events. He was hustling every day. Nothing out of it. I remember we had a feedback kind of meeting in December. I'm like, Peter, I see how you try. I can like I haven't seen anyone try as much. But where the fuck are the results? Like, you know, like there must be something. We need to have to do something better. The truth is, it takes so long in B2B. It takes so long in B2B. Like he was doing his best. He was actually doing good things. And we were also lucky in December. We had one interesting event where we met some uh, customers that actually gave us. Uh, like by using Slido, they gave us the credibility to others. We won uh, like an event technology startup award uh, in London, which also gave us some credibility. So we were able to start closing the first customers the next year. And now London is like 25% of our business. It's our biggest market by far. And it was critical, uh, absolutely critical for us to be there because basically from there, like Australia, uh, which we never ever even tried to approach because many people from Australia go to London. Now Australia is actually a pretty big market for us. And you know, like it just starts spreading. So going to London was absolutely critical. And then that also gave us some, some proof that if it works in London, it can work anywhere in the world. Um, you mentioned the part about uh, the customers were giving you feedback, etc. It was important. Um, did you always take their feedback? Because I mean, there are some cases that you know the, the founders, especially you know the co-founders, see the vision, and you know maybe the market is saying something else, and you know just like how 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 did how did you tackle this? Did you go very analytically? Like sixty percent say that we go that way. That's a really tough one, and I think <coughs> like. From the beginning, we, the vision was actually how can we make the presentation, how can we make the talks like this better, how can we make them more relevant for the audience and, and you know increase the value for the audience. Uh, so we'll get back to the question soon, but uh, that was from the beginning of the vision and there were many ideas from the customers that we knew that they're just taking us out away from the vision. For example, IDC was one good example. It's, it's a very, very prestigious client. It's a research company which if we would get it in the beginning, it would be also interesting money, but the huge credibility boost. But they wanted such ridiculous features from us, they were just stuck at taking us in completely wrong direction. So at the end, uh, we didn't you know, hold to that client, but we were focusing on the client, they were kind of more in line with our vision. And it's always a struggle, you're always discussing in the team, and basically you never know for sure. Like you always have to trust your gut, you have to try, and then you actually, I think what really helped for us was that we, at the beginning, try to go to most of the events that use Slido, and really sit there, be there, and see you know, what's going on, how it's going to change, what we can do. Uh, and then also like by giving a great support to our customers, by seeing what they are struggling with and what they care about, you start seeing some patterns in the value. So they tell you a lot of different features, but you start seeing some patterns in the problems they have. And then you choose, okay, is this problem consistent with the value we are trying to deliver? But it's not easy, and even now, we still have discussions like, okay, what to build next, where to go next. I don't think that ever gets easier. Um, and, well, talking to clients and closing clients, it's, it's uh, that's the hardest part. Uh, could you maybe tell us one example about, you know, how you were, I mean, were chasing after a client, it wasn't working, and then eventually closed it, like, how was the process? You know, business development, you know, some people it takes years, some for some months. Could you tell us one example? Yeah. Uh, this is the probably <clears throat> most difficult part about B2B. It takes forever, especially with really good clients. It takes a long, long time. And I think that for you as a kind of impatient entrepreneur at the beginning, it can be really frustrating because at the beginning you have to put a lot of effort and do all the right steps and you don't see any result, any return. And I can give you an example, for example, World Economic Forum is a good one, like, right? That's probably the most prestigious event in the world. And uh, they're now a customer of ours. And that took us maybe two years to get them. And we've, there's a camera, we messed it up uh, big time. Uh, the first the first time uh, when they started using Slido, like they had, they didn't have the best experience. Like 
there was some kind of technical issues that they experienced, so they actually stopped using Slido for a half year. But then there was an event in, in Barcelona somewhere, and I saw there's someone from World World Economic Forum. I was going there, so we connected. We told, we shared the same kind of values. Uh, we discussed. They gave us chance again, chance again. They used us in China, where I was basically supporting them from 1 a.m. every day. And you know, the day before the event, I received an email: Peter, Slido not working in China. And five minutes later, actually, the whole internet is not working in China. I'm like. And I'm like, okay, so give us more. And we're trying to, you know, for the whole three days, we're trying to troubleshoot the Chinese firewall, which was like impossible. We're trying like all the different hacks, servers, cloud from whatever. Like we're trying everything. At the end, it seems we found the solution. We don't know if for sure because they didn't even use it for one session at the end, but they so appreciate the support. They said, okay, well, we appreciate, we want to try it in doubles. So that was the thing, like we completely messed up China again. That was the second time basically. And, uh, but still, because like you did everything, they, they gave you the chance in doubles and the doubles went really great. But again, the support they received was, uh, we gave it our best. So. Uh, would, you, would you do anything differently to, in order to like avoid such mistakes? Or like what were the learnings of, from, from you know, these big clients? That's a really good question, actually, because what I found out is I was chasing those big, big prizes from the beginning, you know, like South by Southwest and, and everyone, and, and, you know, with some of them I had a really good kind of traction, and thankfully they said no, because if they would say yes, they, it would kill us, it would definitely kill us, we were not ready for the client, and even like for some of the big clients we're dealing with right now, like corporations, of course we wanted them two years ago, but we had, we had no idea what we don't know, and we had no chance actually to give them a good solution. Even now we are like, really just discovering what it really takes to actually serve a client like that on an enterprise level, like what kind of security, legal, and, and other things they, they really require. So it really like you are not, in the beginning, you might not be ready for the customer, so be careful what you wish for. And the World Economic Forum was one year too early for us. And we didn't know it at that time, like you never think your solution is not good enough thankfully, because otherwise it would be hard to convince the client. But uh, yeah, like many of the customers that we later were able to convince, we were lucky that we didn't convince them earlier. Um, many startups in their kind of early days, they uh, provide their products or services free of charge or try to do the freemium kind of model. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you think is, is the right way? To, to offer, to give them the free product and then you know, build a reputation or you, know, you pay for what you get? So we still have premium, and there's a good reason for that, and it works quite okay for us. Uh, like there's good conversion logic uh, there. But the truth is like at the beginning, even for clients that were supposed to pay, we were like, okay, just use it. Like here it is for free, and it was a big, big mistake. It was a big, big mistake, especially because if you give it to them for free, they don't value the solution so much. Like if they pay for it, they make an investment, and they're gonna make sure they use it properly. But if if you gave it to them for free, especially at events where so many things can go wrong and it's, it's really stressful, the one thing they easily give up is, you know, this free tool, yeah, no one cares about it. But if they paid for it, they made an investment, if I had to convince my manager to pay for the money, I'm not gonna, you know, let it down easily right now. So we actually found out that for the important uh, events, it's really important either to make sure they use it properly in some other way or make them pay for it and then they will actually use it much better. So the premium as a model works for us, but don't just give out your solution. Make sure the client actually pays for it because it's also test, like, it's a sign for you that they really value the solution, but you will get much better approach from them in the end. Um, now I kind of shift more towards the, your company and Slido itself. Um, how big is your team at the moment? So we are 50 now. Uh, five zero fifty. Five zero, yeah. And it's basically spread now, like we have customers all around the world, so more than half is basically customer success. Uh, because especially at events, we really want to make sure our clients have a good experience and five seconds can basically make a difference, uh, you know, when you're helping the client. So we want to make sure like we have the team all around the world that can help the clients. So we have one person in Australia, Taiwan, Singapore, and then some people in the US, UK, and then here in Europe. How, how do you find people to your team? 
most of the people actually come from Slovakia. So even the guy in Australia, like uh, one of our colleagues asked him like if he knows anyone smarter and he was like, me? Was, okay. <laughs> so, you know, like it's usually uh, what kind of references from smart people that the people in the team know. Uh, and that's how, how we were able to build the team so far. Would you say that uh, the company where it started still is following the same vision or is it kind of changing? Like, is there still, 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 still the same light at the end of the town? town? The same. Same. Could you maybe elaborate? Like, what is the vision? Like, what do you want to... I mean, do you have a sentence of, out of these companies? Like, you know, on, the, on their walls, like, company vision? Uh, we don't have that, but the, the, the kind of, in a short... Like, to describe the problem here, it's really hard, right, to have a conversation uh, with you guys here, even like in such a small group, imagine there's thousand people in the room. It's really hard for you guys to have a conversation with the speaker, especially if you know we don't have, we have no clue what you want and why you came. And what we try to do with Slido is actually really make sure you guys are part of the conversation. So the questions uh, from there, and I will try to see them better. So by involving them and by answering your question, we make sure that you get some some value. And that's basically what we're trying to tackle, like making sure people maximize the value out of going to a conference, out of going to a session, uh, and making sure that there can be a great conversation. And actually facilitator like you're doing, that's, that's a critical part of, of that equation. Uh, do you see uh, any shifts in the events industry uh, where maybe you could, you are spotting another opportunity or what are the other opportunities for Slido? Yeah, that's, that's actually, Kind of really important question in, in terms of like one of our core values is like don't stop push the boundaries and always innovate and, and really stay looking ahead uh, and the thing is like when we we're starting slido it was something that was definitely not like a trend like people are like okay the wi-fi is not going to work and it's going to be distracting and why would anyone want to send the questions so we were lucky that we we're starting in a phase that was like too early and when it kind of started becoming like a normal thing, we're already there as a, as a player. So we're a bit early there. But it can also make you comfortable. Like now we have you know, a lot of clients and they keep you busy. And any change that you bring, especially for the corporate clients, they don't like the change. They bought a solution that works for them. They have some requirements, but their requirements are usually very much day to day. They don't want you to you know, push the boundaries. So that actually creates some, some um, you know, obstacles to innovation and I think Keeping that focus and always trying to see okay where we can move the solution that's uh, that's critical and especially right now I think there are some mega trends in the industry that uh, that for example every event is going to be live streamed in five years and if not live streamed recorded on a video uh, or at every public event right uh, there will be probably like the VR and AR like we'll see how they play but they might very much changed the equation, how people will travel. Uh, the whole Snapchat thing is basically bringing the AR thing from a very different angle uh, to, to something that people will accept. And you know, there's so many trends that you need to stay, uh, stay in there. And also, also in the corporate world, there's gonna be a monumental fight in terms of how many of you guys use Slack? Okay, not that many yet. Uh, there's gonna be, you know, Microsoft Teams just announced the product, Facebook Workplace, Google might do something there. Like this is gonna be a huge fight in, in the workplace productivity and communication. And there's going to very much influence how corporate clients use Slido as well. So we need to make sure like we watch these trends and we know where we can position the company in those trends. Um, how is it to work for you? You are uh, the CEO, uh, you're 50 people, uh, how is the company culture? How do you how do you manage that? Uh, it's fun. <laughs> uh, you can come for a coffee if you want to learn more. <laughs> but um, we, as I said, like we have we basically have three core values that very much influence everything we do. And number one is we borrow this one from Shkoda. It's like simple and clever. You know, make it simple but make it clever. Like simple is not enough. Right? So you want to make sure in everything you do, not just in the product, in code, but in, you know, in the communication, everything. Simple, clever is, is, uh, is the number one thing that you want to strive for. The second one is like we care, and we want to really 
get people into the company that care. And it's, we, they care about the customer, they care about the team, but they care about doing things well. And if you have people that care, and you can feel the difference. If you play any sport, you can feel if you have teammate that cares and teammate doesn't care. It's, you know, it makes a lot of difference with your mental health as well. So that's the second one. You want to have people on the team that really care. And the third one is exactly, you want to have people on the team that never stop learning, never stop improving. They always try to push the things. And then if you have this kind of chemistry in the team, uh, it's fun. Like you're always learning from, from the team. You're always basically, what I love about Slido is that, you know, right now with the 50 people, I can't see anything anymore. But after half year, I look at, you know, an area that I haven't looked for half year. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. Like, where did it move? And you want to see basically different parts of the company evolving in this way. And that's that's great feeling. So I think that the values and culture that the company describes it. Um, going to my last chapter before jumping into uh, slider questions. Uh, what do you what do you think is the kind of happening in the future for you personally? Uh, what's happening for uh, the company? Do you want to stay in Slovakia since you go in more? Like, most of the clients are outside of Slovakia. What are the future plans? Good question. <laughs> uh, so the one thing about especially building a B two B company, the kind of rule of thumb is that it takes seven to ten years to build anything kind of sustainable or big, big enough, or even like that can survive, you know, that's, that's an interesting company, seven to 10 years. So we kind of think about this as a Wimbledon. The first three years were the qualification, we survived that. Now we are in the fifth year, so maybe we are in the second year of the Wimbledon, there's still five years, five rounds in front of us before we reach the final, and every round is gonna be more difficult. So I, for the next five years, I see the final in there. Hopefully, you know, every round we will survive and get closer to the final. And uh, for the company, you know, you do whatever it takes to win the next round. So you're trying to build a great team here because this will always be the foundation for per slide. And we, besides the vision for the product and for actually the vision for the customers, we have a very strong vision in terms of. Uh, Slovakia, where we would like to help Slovakia by bringing all the know-how, bringing all the things we learn out there back here, you know, to, to help other people also get inspired. Because that's how we started. Like well, before we actually went for Startup Weekend, I had the chance to go a conference, go to a conference where Adam uh, Shomai from Prezi was speaking, and I was like, "Oh, Adam from Prezi is speaking at this conference," and uh, then I learned like he's from Budapest. Budapest, Prezi is from Budapest, I didn't know that. And it was really interesting for me to see a world-class product, a world-class company is from Budapest, and they are able to build it there. So then I kind of we became friends, and uh, he gave us some very good advice at the beginning. And it was incredible, like that was, like we, for the first two, three years, we basically followed uh, the path that Prezi took. It was so valuable to have someone like that here. And I think in Slovakia, there are different kind of companies, different kind of segments, and we really need more uh, role models, more success stories here to bring the whole community, uh, you know, higher and basically to make this better place because, you know, even with Orban, Budapest is not lost because they have great people, great companies, great community there. And in our situation, in our country, like, you might have different political opinions, but I think despite the politics, if we build great things from here and if we keep growing as a community and people, we can make this a great place to live in. So that's so yourself, you came from the community startup weekend. It's a very important event in the community. Um, do you still follow the Slovak Bratislava community? A little less now, like there's not much time and I travel quite a bit, but uh, I see the events are happening, but you know, like you're, you can't attend all the events. Uh, so what do you think we could improve in? So as I said, like I think our task right now is to make sure we maximize the learning we can bring back and then actually start giving giving out as well. Uh, that's what our role what we can play. I think that's what we will be trying to be doing. Uh, other other people can do the same. If you have some amazing knowledge, amazing know-how, like share it. Share it with others. Like you might feel like okay, I have this unique know-how in Slovakia, I can charge more money because I'm the only one. 
bullshit. Like if you want to build anything really world class, you need the team players. You need the other people around you who are gonna build, who are gonna move the whole ecosystem up. Actually, it was funny. Like when I met with Adam the first time, I asked him at the end, like, what's your KPI? What's your goal for the year? And he said, my number one priority is to help the Budapest community. And it was because he realized they cannot build a world class company without the world class ecosystem around them. So I think that's definitely what we need to do here. We need to build more world class companies, help each other uh, grow faster, grow better. And uh, yeah. And uh, one of my last questions uh, from my questions um, What is your uh, kind of role? Who is your role model or what company you admire the most? Yeah, so as I mentioned, like Prezi was a huge inspiration for us at the beginning because they had a very similar market and Adam is just like, it's crazy. Like if you would he listen to him, he looks like the most humble person in the world. Like you would never ever guess that he basically built, he co-founded like a multi-million dollar company uh, or billion or whatever. Uh, incredible, incredible person. Uh, then Slack, as I mentioned, if you guys haven't used Slack, like use it because that's probably the most fascinating company in terms of marketing, uh, how they connected the technology and the product. It's incredible how they do things. They're a huge inspiration for us in, in many ways as a company. Trello is a great company. And in terms of, uh, of people, uh, especially if you're thinking about B2B company and SaaS business, there's one guy, one blog that I recommend everyone read. Like forget about anything I say, go to saaster.com, S-A-A-S-T-R.com. And that's a blog about startups, B2B, SaaS, what it takes. And he writes about all the different stages. Uh, I, we learned so much from there. And they have a big conference in February in San Francisco. I'm going there for the third time. I'm looking forward to it like a small kid. I'm going to learn so much. And then there's also the Startup Grind conference in February. It's going to be amazing as well. So guys, buy the tickets. It's only a thousand grand or something. <laughs> uh, but it's worth it. I can help you out, so just shoot me an email if you want to go to the Startup Grand Conference in Silicon Valley. 20th of February? No, yeah, 20th of February. You should know. Doing a little <laughs> promo here. And my last question, so what is the, what is the message you would uh, convey or give to our audience, but also the global community, since we're being recorded? I don't know, like I'm not a big proponent of some global messages or something. Uh, if you guys have any you know, specific questions you would like to ask, I would be very happy to give you my opinion, but maybe there is the final message, okay? Uh, one of the lessons, uh, kind of hard lessons I learned was, that especially at the, in, during the first year, I was trying to you know, meet with so many smart people and ask them for their feedback, like about the product, about the company and so on. And I was always expecting from the meeting, like, okay, this is gonna be that meeting. This is gonna move us, it's gonna show us the light. It's gonna really like change things. The truth is they, most of the people, when you meet them, they give you one hour of their time. But the, really one hour, they meet you. They didn't think about you before. They think about you for one hour. They really honestly want to help you during that one hour. And then after that one hour, they forget about you. So they have one hour. You're spending 24 hours every day thinking about your business. You know so many things, they have one hour. So I met a lot of people, they gave me amazing advice, which was total bullshit for us. So you have to kind of recognize that which people can actually give you relevant feedback. And for us, it was, it was also not easy to recognize at the beginning, but people like Adam, for example, who had very similar vision, who had very similar business model, who had very similar audience, so that feedback, that advice was immediately, like it was clicking in my head. And I knew, okay, this is something which gives us some amazing insights and patterns we can follow. But most of the other feedbacks, if we would follow them, we would die. And it was from smart people who meant well. So that was the thing, like you have to choose your own journey, but choose the feedback and the lessons you are taking. Many of the things I'm telling you right now are totally not appropriate for you and in your situation, but some might be. And you have to be always the one who decides about the decision. It's always in your, your hands. Maybe, you know, some final message. Well, that was well said. All right, let's jump. Uh, let me stand up here because I have a weird angle on it. Um, so, first question: What was your greatest failure, and what have you learned from it? I always like those. <laughs> uh, there are so many of them that it's hard to choose the greatest one. But I would maybe repeat um, 
the one when we actually, so for two years almost, I was really trying to raise money uh, for the startup because that's kind of common knowledge of what you should be doing with your startup. You should be, you know, raising money because that will make, like if you raise the money, that means you're successful. It's complete bullshit. If you raise money, that means that you can't earn money for yourself. And, you know, like it's, it's a little bit sick logic. Sometimes you need the money to grow faster, but especially at the beginning, the money can really uh, detract from the journey you're going. And for example, at the beginning for us, uh, when we received like the second, second funding, it was amazing, like uh, it helped us a lot, but the first reaction, it was a little bit more money, not too many, uh, not too much, but our my reaction was like, okay, now we have all this money, we are growing like this so far, now we need to grow like this. So I started doing complete like things that we never did before. I started doing things, you know, just to try growing faster that we never tested before. And of course they didn't, didn't, it didn't work. So we wasted maybe 30% of the money in the first four months. And I'm like, whoops, if this company is we're bankrupt very soon. So we, you know, we slowed it down and we decided, okay, let's focus on the things we were doing well before and then let's do them better. And then the money kind of lasted us until now. Like we didn't have to raise additional money afterwards. But I was kind of the impact money can have on you. That's, that's a very important one uh, to realize that. And at the same time, just chasing investor money for, for having the money doesn't make sense. Like the best thing you can do with your startup is actually grow it yourself because then you don't give up the share. You don't have to have all these crazy restrictions and, and institutional investors especially have very strict obligation expectations from you. So be very careful if you're chasing institutional money. Uh, and you should know exactly why and what do you want to do with the money. And if you want any like more direct advice about that, I would be very happy to you know talk to you afterwards or even for a coffee later. But it was a big lesson for me to realize that investor money is not something to celebrate. It's, it's necessary fuel for you to grow faster, but you need to know exactly how you're going to use it. That's where the hard work starts, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, if you could start a new and a new venture, I guess, and could have done one thing differently, uh, what would it be? Wow. Uh, I'm lucky in a way that I have very bad memory. So when I fail, I, I'm really angry for a while and then I forget, thankfully. Uh, so I take every failure as a super important part of the journey. Like I wish, you know, after wasting the money, I wish like, oh, I, I wish I wasn't so stupid. But thanks to that, it helped me avoid so many other mistakes. And actually, Rusty Direct in San Francisco told me at the time, like, be happy for the lesson. It was really cheap lesson for you. And, you know, I think the biggest failures I had were probably most important ones to change, like to help us avoid bigger mistakes in the future. So, uh, you know, in terms of the mistake, we thankfully haven't done any fatal mistake that would kill us. But we basically, you know, within the company, if you ask about the culture, we celebrate the mistakes. We discuss about them openly. And I'm almost a little bit freak in terms of, if you don't analyze the mistake, like not analyze, but if you don't really discuss the mistake deeply, then you wasted the mistake. That's the worst thing that can happen. If you fail and you don't learn from the mistake, that's the worst kind of waste. So make sure you learn from your mistakes and celebrate them and then forget because, you know, otherwise. All right. Uh, da, da, da. Aren't we too humble and have almost no self-confidence, even though we, evil companies, could compete with top stars and be at least even? Speaking of, I guess, like slower people at the slower nature. I really like humble people. And I think it's an amazing quality. And for example, like the Kevin Hart from Even Bright, uh, when I had the chance to meet him, like he's an incredible person, he was so humble. He knows 5,000 times more than I know, but when he was giving me advice, even though, even though he knew exactly what he was telling me, he always gave it in, in a way that, okay, you know the best about your company, this is what I think. You know, this is and the best people, I think, are humble because that, that allows you to learn and, and receive. So I don't think slow people are humble. I actually think a little bit that maybe we are losing that uh, humbleness uh, and we should not lose it. Like we should always stay humble and we should stay hungry. And uh, if you feel you're humble, that's great. But don't be, don't be afraid, right? There's a big difference between being humble and being afraid. But yeah, like you can think, okay, in the US, this US guy comes and he bullshits his way through. 
I think one of the things that people, our customers, appreciate about Slido is the, you know, the direct, the trustworthiness, and the humbleness. Maybe I'll tweak it a little bit. So, what do we? Be, I mean, what should we do to compete with the, the top stars, right? Even just you know, looking into Berlin or some other ecosystems. I mean, is, do 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 you think it's a, it's a, it's inside of the people, like? No, I, I think like the biggest problem with Slovakia in general is that if you look at any kind of articles like, oh, Slovakia was 43rd in the ranking somewhere, four places better than Czech Republic. Who the hell cares? Who is Czech Republic? Okay, there are members, but who cares? What is Singapore doing? What is Finland doing? What are those guys doing? Why they are number one? So that's what we did at the beginning, right? We went to London because we wanted to compete against the best. We wanted to get the best customers, tell us why our product sucks, so we can improve it, so they will buy it eventually. Then we went to San Francisco. At the beginning, like, uh, I cannot mention some of the names, but when I was talking to the customers, I literally had to, you know, do anything for them to even try Slido. Now they, it seems really they enjoy using it. So that's what makes you, if you play with Barcelona every day, you will be better. If you play the third league in Slovakia every day, you will stay in the third league. So I think the key here is not be more confident or be cocky or something. Go out there and, com and compete for the best customers and try to make the best product. Next question. What is your vision and mission? How do you merge it with market requirements? Example. Uh, yes, yeah, so that's kind of what I was describing before is that you want to maximize learning for the people and if there would be no value in the market for that then you know the vision would be useless so your vision has to be in line uh, with the market and it has to come from the market as always you know one of the luck that we had with the conferences was that the product was so unstable at the beginning we always went on site and that gave us really good insights into customers and we are still trying to stay close to our customers and that helps helping sh to shape our vision what is the main reason of your uh, big growth during the summer and autumn? Somebody knows inside info, huh? <laughs> uh, no, we kind of grow quite consistently in the past four years, and that's probably because of our business model. Like when people see Slido at the conference, they enjoy it; they will end up using it. So we have quite cons cons uh, consistent growth. And uh, most of our business is actually inbound. Like when people see it, they like it, they enjoy it, or word of mouth. So basically, the more events we do, and if we still keep doing a good job, the fast or the same kind of growth will continue. And, uh, so far, it seems to be holding the pattern. Um, I think we'll do like three to four more questions. Um, so next one is what is what is Slido's business model? And I would add another question to that. Uh, where is, are you, the, the one you're going to describe, and, but are you thinking of any other business models or do you see any other business models that work for Slido? Yeah, so this was another really, really, really good kind of lesson we learned. And that was that the pricing, when you're starting, you're thinking, okay, we'll figure out the pricing later. And uh, actually the pricing is probably, and the business model is probably the most critical part. Well, not the most critical part, but as critical as the product and, and, uh, and the value you're delivering. And I can give you a great example of actually two companies I really admire. One is Slack, which is brilliant, it's brilliant. Like just check their pricing. Uh, it's just brilliant. Like when they started, they had an amazing product, but they had a clear idea how they're gonna monetize it. And when we started using Slack, it was for free. We were using it for free. And then after three months, I was trying to search for a file and it showed me, oh, you can only search the last 10,000 messages. And then I checked my account and I saw I have 150 credits from some surveys I did when I was onboarding. I'm like, oh, so for the next three months, basically I have this tool for free. In three months, okay, I will just decide. Now we're paying them like 500 bucks a month, right? So, and we don't even know. It's like, it's the best thing we have. It's an amazing tool. Uh, and then there's Trello, which I think in terms of product value and quality was almost the same value for us. But they exactly started like, okay, we'll build this amazing business, this amazing product, and we'll figure out the business model later. And you can see it, that it came with some Trello gold and all this kind of bullshit. And it just doesn't work. Like Slack is now several billion dollar company, the fastest growing SaaS company I think in, in history. And Trello, which I think had comparable product and value proposition, is kind of finally starting to monetize the huge customer base they have. They have 17 million customers, but it's really hard for them to monetize because they gave up too much. 
earlier, they didn't think if the business model first. And it was the same for us with Slido a little bit, where we have a freemium, but we still, basically this summer we finally found a pricing that seems to be working, but we will be revisiting it all every half year to see, okay, if this is really uh, the, the right business driver. Okay, uh, if, you just, if you had just one more month of life, what would you do? How would you spend your time? What would you invest your energy in? First of all, I wouldn't want to know about it, and I would just do what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, are you hiring? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Frank. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> No, we are we are always looking for you know amazing people uh, who want to work on a world class product from Slovakia and, and help the country along the process. So, you know, uh, I would be very happy to talk after the talk. <laughs> How does the ideal future for Slido look like? What is the difference between customer experience now and five years from now? So you know the when I was describing the vision at the beginning like where we want to take this, uh, it was almost like when you come to a conference in five years, one of the first things you ask is, uh, what's the slider code, right? And maybe it won't be the slider code anymore. Maybe it will be, you know, automatic. It will just pop up in your phone or something. But basically the idea is that every conference should have a back channel for the audience that allows the audience to maximize the value. And this is just going to happen. Like the live video is gonna happen, and it will either be Slido or it will be something else. It might be a completely different product, maybe it might be social media. They will basically change the whole paradigm, and Slido might not exist in five years at all, but it's gonna happen. And ideally, we wanna play part in that happening, and ideally, we wanna help shape the future. And the last question, um, what was your reasoning to, where did you go? Oh, what was the reasoning to go through uh, to MBA? What did you get out of it? How much experience do you think one should have before doing so? That also interests me. <laughs> yeah, uh, it was definitely a very great experience for me because I was young and I knew nothing. And it like, again opened up my horizons a lot and gave me some good business foundation. But, uh, you know, I would probably not do MBA now uh, if I would be so young, uh, I think you can, you know, you can spend the time more efficiently. And if you would be doing like, if you're thinking about transition, you're in four or five years in some job, you're really good, but you don't see yourself in that future and you want to jump the ship, then go, but go for the best schools, go for Stanford, go for Harvard, but go somewhere where like really you will be forced to compete with the best. And you know, you when you walk out of that school, you will know, okay, I can do things, it will help you, and it will also open up your network, it will give you great value. So, uh, if you go for an MBA, go for the best one. Otherwise, I think, uh, you know, you can, you have better ways how to waste their money. Maybe one extra little one, because this is an interesting one. Um, what is now the most important asset skill value to have in order to work for a Slido? So, when hiring, what do you kind of look for? In Yeah, so number one, absolutely, is like the culture fit, the values, the the mindset of the person. We look for this kind of, like we said, the, the we care. We care about the team, you know, if you're a team player, we care about the customer, you have really strong kind of customer focus, you, you're able to listen, you're able to take feedback. But at the same time, you, know, you have this crazy high standard of excellence, like you just want to make great things. And you basically want stop until it's really good and many people just say you know two hours earlier like oh that's good enough no like you won't let go until it's good enough and also for the customer like you won't let the customer down and it's this kind of attitude mindset of um, of someone you really want to have on a team and, and to actually answer maybe the question a little bit more specifically the best definition of leadership i ever heard is that leaders enable others to achieve great things. And I think you can have a team of 20 people where everyone can be a leader because everyone enables the others in the team to achieve great things. And I think we're looking for leaders with our team in their specific role. They don't have to lead people, but they're a crazy leader. So you fit that requirement, you know. <laughs>
comes out good. All right, perfect. So thank you very much. This was uh, my last question for tonight. Uh, so round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Peter. It was a uh, very <laughs>